Welcome to People Love Process. In this movie, I'm going to showcase a variety of ways you can create big halftone dot graphics you can use with your artwork and graphic designs. One method is within Adobe Illustrator, and the others are assets we'll create using Photoshop, then put them to use within the context of Adobe Illustrator. You're going to learn a lot of fun, creative tactics you can use for a career of creativity. So let's get started. Now, before we jump into this, I want to make a distinction between what I call simulated halftone and true halftone. There is a difference. Simulated halftone tone is simulating the halftone look and feel but if you look closely at it it's just simulated it's just circles that go from small to fat in order to create that illusion this is just an effect applied to a vector object in illustrator if i select this and go to the appearance panel you can see that it has a color halftone effect applied to it if i turn that off you can see all it is is a regular uh, gradient that goes from black to white and once you place a color halftone uh, effect on it it'll turn it into this halftone looking image but it's not a true halftone. What I mean by a true halftone is if you look at the example on the right, the exact same gradient, but it's been turned into a true halftone. A true halftone starts as dots, but then they start to morph into this rounded corner square, and then those metamorphosize from black into white shapes that then go back into a dot format. Now, a gradient isn't the best way to show why this aesthetic looks better as a true halftone than a simulated. So let's jump to a photograph and I'll demonstrate it. So here's a photograph of me, <laughs> Grumpy Vaughn, and it's blurred. And, and I'll explain that when we move into Photoshop because it creates better halftones with a slight blur rather than a hard edge. Uh, this is a photograph of me. And if I select this and use uh, Illustrator's method, which is to go up to effect, we'll go down to pixelate, and then we select color halftone. That will bring up these controls. Now, if you're using a color photograph, you can get some cool uh, effects by adjusting these controls with a color photograph. Right now, this is just a grayscale image uh, that I'm doing that for because we just want to keep it a simplified halftone. So experiment with this on your own with a color photograph, and I think you're going to like some of the results you can pull off. But just know this isn't vector art. This will still be raster after we apply uh, the effect. Now, there are certain plugins, uh, specific ones from astutegraphics.com that you can use within the context of Illustrator, and they'll create simulated halftones, but they'll also provide vector equivalents at the end of that process. So that's kind of cool, and you might want to check those out. But if we look at the controls in this pop-up menu, you have channel one, two, three, and four, and at the uh, top, it uh, labels them as screen angles, degrees. 45 degrees are shown on each of these. But if you think of this as C, M, Y, and K, these are the same type of channels. So if you do this on a colored photograph, whether it's RGB or CMYK, it doesn't really matter, um, it'll change the colors. So this would be cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and you could get diverging uh, kind of halftone uh, patterns by having those angles different. We're going to keep them all the same, 45, but instead of five, I want to set this so it's a fatter, uh, a fatter size dot and we're going to go ahead and do uh, 24 here and we're going to click OK. Now I really wish there was a preview um, button on this. Adobe needs to get their act together and, and 
kind of retrofit all of these hidden functions that are in pop-up menus with that so we don't have to always click OK to see what it's going to look like. I think that's a waste of time. Uh, it, it's definitely not efficient, and they could improve the experience there. But you can see it creates a really cool simulated halftone. Now, I don't mind these. I just prefer authentic, uh, true halftones better, and this looks pretty good. Now, this is a raster image. This isn't vector once again. The background is white. The simulated halftone is black, but that background white is opaque, meaning if I take uh, the rectangle tool and I draw out a rectangle, we'll color it blue, and I copy it to the clipboard and I paste it behind this, you can see that the white isn't transparent. That's one reason why I never use it. Now, you could turn on a blend mode by going to transparency and clicking on multiply, and it would turn the white transparent, but then it's multiplied and assumes anything behind it you want it to multiply with. So it's not as flexible as a bitmap TIFF. So let's go ahead and get rid of this, but you can also colorize this. So if you wanted to colorize it, you could colorize it a red color, for example, and it's only going to colorize those black pixels, the red color. In that case, it's kind of cool. Uh, but once again, a little limiting. So let's go ahead and just remove the color and let's compare it to a true halftone. So here's a true halftone, exact same photograph, but I created the true halftone in, photo, in uh, uh, Photoshop using the method that we're going to go over in just a little bit. And I think this looks even cooler because if you look at the top of the hair, you can see the big... Uh, the big dots and they get smaller as it fades out to the edge. These, they kind of fuse together and create really unique kind of forms and shapes. And that's why I like it. Now, if I take this and I go ahead and copy it, I can set up a design layout. Let's say it's this, maybe it's a poster because when AI crashes, Vaughn gets grumpy. That's definitely true. I paste, paste this graphic. Notice the background of a bitmap TIFF by default, even though it has no fill, no stroke, is transparent. That's the beauty of it. You can colorize it whatever color you want. And of course, you can also um, apply blend modes to it to get a really cool design. So this is the type of asset I want to show you how to create. I'm going to show you several different types. The common denominator between all of them is they're all bitmap TIFFs, but there's different ways you can uh, create it using dithers, you can use uh, circular halftones, you can use uh, uh, kind of a line conversion uh, aesthetic, and I'm going to show you all of those, and then you can pick and choose as you create your own art, your own design, and figure out what method and style is going to work best for your context. So this is one simple example. So we're going to focus on something that's kind of gothic. This is the background we're going to use. This is the design I created. Now, if you think of those companies that will put on mystery dinners where you show up and the theme is there's been somebody murdered and you have to solve Solve the, the murder mystery and they also serve you dinner. This is kind of the same type of thing. It's called Raven House Gothic Tours. A friend of mine on the East Coast runs this and they do the same kind of kind of gothic themed ones. And this was created on on their behalf for that. And what I want to do though, is I want this to be on the background I showed you with the kind of haunted looking castle, but I want it to have a glow around it. So I'm going to select this vector, or click into it. Just, I don't need this inner detail on the type. I just want all the black that makes up the base of the type and the Raven mark itself. And I'm going to copy that, go ahead and leave, uh, um, uh, now I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> Leave that mode where uh, you can click into shapes or groups, that is. We'll go to the glow effects, and I'm just going to paste it. Command F. that will paste it in place. We'll color it blue. So why did I do this? Well, I'm going to make the asset I'm going to use to bring into Photoshop to create the glow. So on a shape like this, we just want to offset it to uh, make the thickness around it. So we'll go ahead and select it. We'll go to object, we'll go to path, and we'll go to offset. 
20 is what I want, so that works. Now make sure you have round turned on because if you have mitering, especially on a font like this that has sharp serifs, these are gonna just freak out. So it always works best to turn round on to contain it from doing that. And then we're gonna click OK. Now the original, the original um, artwork we use, we can just delete that now. This is all we want. If we turn on the logo above it, you can see it's just created a halo shape that we're gonna turn into a halftone dot glow. So I just wanted to show you that. Now on the background itself, the background, this is eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It's for a promotion. So that's the document size. Even though I hide that when I record my videos to make them look cleaner, it is eight and a half by 11 on its side. So once uh, you know what your document size is, I'll just create two shapes like this. Now, this tactic, this methodology goes back to the early 1990s. I was working in a small little design studio in Oregon and a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine, Dave, he was working with me and he, uh, I'm sorry, John, not Dave. I know too many Johns, too many Daves, so I get them mixed up all the time. Uh, my friend John was working with me and he did a lot of our production. He was really smart at that. And this is Photoshop in its very early stages. I, I want to say it didn't have layers. I know I used it when it didn't have layers, but I think it had a minimal amount of layers you could have. And so we were doing a t-shirt design. I wanted to glow around it, but I wanted that glow to be halftone. And me and him figured this out together. So uh, this is one trick we did. We wanted to keep it in register. And because I'm creating a doc on a document that's eight and a half by 11 horizontal, I'll create these throwaway shapes like this and I'll line it to the top left corner to the left and top there. And then the bottom right corner to the right and the bottom here, these aren't going to stay blue. We'll color these in RGB black like this. And now all I'm going to do is copy this to the clipboard, Command C. Now that it's copied to the clipboard, we're going to switch over to Photoshop and I'll show you how to create a, a halftone assets and all the other assets as well. So let's switch over to Photoshop. We have a document size set up in Photoshop, the same size as our AI document, eight and a half by 11 horizontal. And all we wanna do is paste it. So Command V, and it doesn't matter if it's smart object or pixels, uh, pixels is gonna be fine. We'll click okay. And because we use those bounding boxes, it registers it exactly where we need. And you can see up here, it's 100%. We'll commit to that. I'll use the selection tool just to select these uh, elements that we don't need, which are the corner. And this is what we want. I have an FPO here so we can check out um, our graphic as we create it, but ultimately that won't even be part of it. With this layer selected now, all we're gonna do is we're gonna first Gaussian blur it. So I'm gonna go up here to filter, blur. We'll go to Gaussian blur. It's uh, defaulting to the last time I used it, which is 15. I want this to be quite a bit more. Something like that, maybe more. Let's go 60, click OK. And then this is why I have the FPO, and I think that's going to look good. So uh, we're going to go with that. So I blurred it 60 pixels, and now we want to go ahead and create the halftone effect. And so what I want to do is go up here to image mode. We're going to switch to grayscale. Right now we're in RGB. And I always create it in RGB first because if you copy out an illustrator using regular black, it won't be dark black. It'll come off as dark gray and that's going to screw up the halftone. So always use RGB black, then convert to grayscale. And that's what we're going to do here. You want to flatten it. Make sure you have your source PSD file saved. So if you flatten it, you can always go back to what you had prior. Then we'll go back to image, back to mode. Now we're going to select bitmap. 
And when this window comes up, it's going to show you the input resolution that you're working, which is 400. That's fine. We'll keep that same resolution. That's not always the case based off of the type of uh, image you're creating. You want to have halftone screen selected. By default, it's probably going to be on 50% threshold. You don't want that. You want to select halftone screen and click OK. Now this will bring up the halftone controls. So a halftone will have a line screen to it. This is a tiny line screen. This, is, this, this would make the dots really big and probably not that great. We're going to try one first. We'll try, I don't know, let's say 28. So 28 halftone dots per inch or lines per inch. And we want to keep the angle... Uh, 45 that's fine and we want round you can do diamond ellipse linear square and cross to get the same kind of look but just use different shapes to create it and we will go over uh, the, the line one because that's really cool in a certain context so let's go ahead and commit to this see what it looks like again this is where they should have a preview um, it shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to click OK in order to see something but we'll do it and this is what you're going to get. Now, if I zoom in on this, you can see it creates that halftone, but that's a bit too fine, I think. I think we want to get it a little beefier. So this is where I'll just go Command-Z. It will take me back to the stage where I'm at grayscale. So I'll go back to a bitmap. I'll go, yes, that's fine. Yes, I want halftone. Click it. And instead of 28, we're going to do 18. And we're going to click on it. And I think that's going to work great for our halftone. So all I have to do now is I have to go uh, save as or save, doesn't matter. Click desktop and we'll save it and we'll name it uh, for lack of a term glow. And this is where I'll put parentheses and then I'll type in whatever LPI I use. That way, if I'm referencing back to a TIFF I used in one project, I'll be able to know exactly what settings I use to create it. That's helpful because if I want to create other graphics that match those settings, so we'll put in 18 LPI, make sure to save it to the desktop, and click Save. I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to click Non and uh, um, Macintosh. You might want to choose others if you're on a PC and click OK. And I'll show you how we use that uh, um, in in just a little bit. Let's switch to another one. This is the one I showed you. Once again, the PSD is in the the exercise files. This just started off as a is a iPhone photograph and you might be going, you take much of those pictures, Vaughn? Well, actually I got an email from my art rep and we had quoted a project for a well-known brand. If I said it, you'd know exactly uh, what brand it is, is a food brand. And they wanted to create a mascot character outfit that somebody could put on and wear at events. And we were um, asked to quote on doing concept sketches of what it could look like. Well, we provided them a great, uh, a great quote, but they decide to keep it in the house, which is never fun to hear. And then my rep saw what they came up with on LinkedIn and sent me an image and link to it. And my only response was this photograph just to make him laugh, you know, and anyway, that's where it came from. So this is how I got to this point. Once I have this, I'll go to image mode, grayscale again. It'll ask you if you want to flatten, just make sure you have your original PSD uh, saved, in which case you can just click flatten. We'll go back to image, back to mode. We'll go to bitmap, and this is where uh, we'll make some decisions on what resolution, uh, what resolution we want to do for this. Now, on this one specifically, I think we want to uh, we want to go ahead and keep this at least 400. You can see it's a little higher on my input, but that's fine. And by the way, when you're doing this, you could put in 600 if you wanted. And you're going, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're up -resing it. It doesn't matter. Trust me, it doesn't matter. Uh, but in this case, we're going to keep it 400. This is where experimentation comes in because I've been doing this for well over 20 years now, uh, creating graphics. I did this a lot at Upper Deck to use in uh, uh, baseball 
card designs and we want to keep the halftone screen selected. We'll click OK. But here, instead of 18, we're going to do 10. So that means it's going to be a bigger dot. The smaller the number, the bigger the dot. The higher the number, the finer the dot. And now if I click OK, and that's what you saw me use inside of Illustrator, that's exactly how I created it. This is actually the source file, uh, the PSD that you can access in the exercise files. Uh, let me show you another one because we're going to put this to use too. And this is a different kind of bitmap TIFF. This is what's called a dither. And this one I derived from a stock photo from Adobe Stock of Lightning. As you can see here, I blew it out in black and white, grayscale, just so I could isolate the glow, some of the glow, and the, the lightning bolts themselves. And then I inversed it because this is what we want to turn into a dither. So I'm going to go to image mode. Right now it's grayscale. We'll switch to bitmap. It'll say, do you want to flatten it? That's fine. And this is where we'll go ahead and input the same resolution we used, which is 300. And instead of halftone, we want to select dither. Now, if I put in 300, I should point this out, it'd be way too fine. That means there would be 300 dithered dots, not dots really, squares, pixels, per inch. And that's way, way, way too fine. Now you might have to experiment back and forth a few times to find the perfect setting. Um, and once again, it'd be nice if you could have a preview on this window because then you wouldn't have to do that. You could do it all within this window, but Adobe never goes back and fixes stuff that they never thought through all the way. Uh, fat chance they're, they're ever going to do that, in my opinion. So in this case, I don't want 300. I only wanted a third that amount, 100, and we're going to click OK. This is what you're going to end up with. It's just a dither of that photo so it keeps that glow but the glow is turned into simply black and white pixels and you're going well that's kind of stair steppy kind of pixelated looking well keep in mind this is 500 percent larger than the size we're going to use it so that means if you look at it at 100 percent that looks great and it's going to work great now here's the crazy part about uh about dithers super lightweight. If we go to image and we go to image size, look at the size, 122.1K. That's like next to not, there's text files that are bigger than that. And that's the beauty of it. That's why it works great for using in a specifically a screen print context. But in this case, we're using it for print and it's going to work well. And you're going to see that in just a little bit. Let's go to another one. This is Incognito Man. This is just a photograph from an old photo um, I found from the 50s. Some guy standing outside of his barn, I think it was, or whatever. And I just thought he looked cool. And so I used it in context of an audiobook cover uh, design I did. And uh, this is what we're going to convert. So the kind of conversion we're going to do here, we'll go back. We're going to go to bitmap again. And we want the input resolution to match um, our output. So we'll punch in 600. And for method, we want halftone, but we're not going to use dots. So we'll click OK. It'll bring up this window. This is where we're going to go ahead and use uh, the, the line per inch. We'll use 10. And here, instead of 45 degrees that way, we're going to go minus 45 degrees. And on shape, instead of round, we're going to go to line. So if you think of the old AT&T logo, well, not old, it's still kind of this way. It's just 3D now. When I was in art school, AT&T rebranded. And when it came out, it was a line conversion type mark of what at the time I called it the Death Star. Um, it still kind of looks like the Death Star. It's just all 3D modeled now. Um, I don't like it as much as the old one. Now, that's kind of the aesthetic you're going to get here. If I click OK, once again, it'd be nice if there's a preview, but we'll click OK. This is what you're going to get. Is that not cool looking? And keep in mind, this is going to be a bitmap, but you could image trace it. Now, if you want to create this and have it vector, 
once again, go look at astutegraphics.com plugins because they have a plugin that will do this and create vector art from it. So it's kind of cool. Uh, so we're going to showcase this in context coming up. And the last one I want to show you is you can create your asset much like the halftone a perimeter we're creating for the Raven House Gothic. But in this case, this was, I wanted something that was more of a unique burst type shape. And this was easy to create in Illustrator. I bring it into Photoshop. And all I want to do with this now is I want to go ahead and blow it out and make it look cool. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go to filter. We're going to go ahead to go blur, Gaussian blur, and just so it's not a perfect, crisp, sharp edge uh, image, because that doesn't make for great halftone. Halftone needs kind of uh, mid-tone values to create that halftone and how it morphs into different shapes. So we're going to just put 15 pixels here to diffuse that edge like that. So it's imperfect now. Then we're going to use a different kind of blur. And this is where experimentation comes in because over the years, I, I've realized doing certain things really looks kind of cool. We're going to use a radial blur. I don't know if you've ever used this. Motion blur is good too for certain things. Like we could have gone into that, uh, that line conversion and we could bring it back into grayscale and we could use a motion blur on that and even half tone it after we converted it. So a lot of things you can do. So experiment, but we're going to use radial blur. And if you're not familiar with radial blur, well, this will do it from the center out. So right now this allows you to control the positioning of where you want it. Um, this isn't ideal because this represents your document. Well, my document's more of a kind of a, a stubby, a uh, rectangle than it is a perfect square, but this represents the middle of where my visual space is. But if I look at this, this center of this graphic is kind of off center from the document. So I'll want to move this over right about there like that. We'll use best as the quality. Why would you do anything less than that? Uh, zoom is what we want and 55 is the amount. And if you look at these lines, you can go shorter like this, or you can go all the way up. I think that's too much. We want to go to about 55, I think would work like that. And now we're going to click OK. Now, once again, I wish there was a preview on this. Now, this has been in uh, Photoshop for a long time. And I remember back in the day, if you click this and you waited you're waiting a long time back in the day, back in the 90s. I'm on an M1 um, iMac, so hopefully this will go pretty quick. We'll go ahead and click OK. So based off of whatever machine and processor it has, um, and there you go. So that didn't take too long at all. A lot faster than, than uh, early to mid 1990s, let's put it that way. Uh, we're going to go back up to image. We're going to go to mode. We're going to go to grayscale, back to image mode and bitmap. And the input is fine. We'll use halftone again. So we'll click on that. We're going to make sure this is just regular 45. I want this to be round. And on the halftone for this, I think... I'm not sure what we're going to do. Let, well, we'll try. Let's just try 10. What we used last time. See what that looks like. Wow. That. Uh, I think it needs to be a little bigger. So let's go command Z. And go back and do bitmap again. Click OK. I think just a little bigger. We'll go eight. There we go. So that's going to work great. So now we're going to switch back over to Illustrator and then I'll walk you through how we use the halftone glow we created for Raven House and how I put those other uh, halftones and bitmap types to work in our design. Let's go ahead and go command switch back to Illustrator now. This is what we had copied out of Illustrator. We don't need any of this so we can just delete it. This is where we'll go ahead and place. So I have an F key set up to place. If you don't, just go to File, Place. Notice I have F10. That way I never have to go there. I just hit F10, select what we saved to the desktop, 
click place, make sure you're on the right layer and go ahead and place it. We'll align it with our artboard Use the alignment palette like that. Just so you can see it, I'll color it. Once again, it's a bitmap, so the white is transparent by default. So if I turn on the background, that's what we get. We don't want it blue. Blue's not bad, but I think we want this white like that. That looks pretty good. So that's the glow to make that pop off the background. Now, the other thing is the dithered lightning. Let's turn these on. Here's those dithers placed into Illustrator. Once again, these are whatever's white in a bitmap TIFF is transparent. So if we color these blue, just so you can see it while I'm moving it over, we'll position this so you can see how that looks. We'll go ahead and color that back white. We'll do this one. We'll color that so we can see it as we bring it over here like that. And we can color that white as well. And I think that looks pretty cool. So it's a lot of fun to use these resources. And even though Illustrator is a vector-based program, I've been using it for the last 20 some years whenever I wanted to as a staging ground to compose layouts. Now you saw that in the poster collage I put together in a previous movie, but I use that tactic a lot. And if you're doing a design, a poster design, whatever, um, think of how you can use these different types of um, uh, bitmap TIFFs within the context of Illustrator. It's very flexible. All of these things are colorable. So if I wanted the glow and the lightning uh, to be yellow, it could be that as well. So a lot of things you can choose. Uh, here's the Incognito Man graphic that I used on the cover here. So that came out kind of cool. Uh, that burst one I created, uh, we used it in this context with another halftone of this face. This is some guy I pulled out old uh, Popular Mechanics magazine from way back, like the 50s, 40, 1948, something like that, and just halftoned it because it's crazy. And it's just fun to, to use these kind of images and to compose them with vector graphics and color them and just come up with a really cool composition. So you want to be a smartest. You want to be able to think outside the box. Engineers at Adobe, they create Illustrator for specifically vector reasons, but don't let it limit you to only vectors. It's always great to use vector art. Uh, the typography in this design is all vector based, but everything else is bitmap TIFF images. Um, and that includes Einstein's head. And by the way, I should point out that whether it's this or this design or this one, all three of the source files on these are included in the exercise files as well, including the layered PSD of Einstein, how I isolated his head and turned him into a bitmap halftone TIFF that I can use in context of this design. Also the, the Rosen Einstein bridge, the wormhole uh, diagram, these are all bitmap TIFFs. The, the um, E equals MC squared and the relativity uh, kind of equations I found on old photography on um, chalkboards and just kind of inversed it in Photoshop and turned those into bitmap TIFFs. So it's a lot of fun you can do. And obviously his uh, 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 theory of relativity and his, um, can't remember the other theory, is the main equation that's over the smartest type. So a lot of these things you can turn around and figure out how you can use them within your design. Now, the first time I ever tried creating a halftone was literally around 1992. And I... I believe it was in the context of a t-shirt. I think that's what it was. And I've been using the same general methodology, methodology ever since. As the saying goes, if something isn't broken, don't try to fix it. So whether it's a halftone, a techno kind of vibe, line conversion, or a dither, all of them work great for print collateral, posters, screen printing, etc. So experiment with these methods and you'll discover other ways to use them as well. If you like this movie, I'd appreciate you sharing a link 
uh, to my YouTube channel with someone you think would enjoy this content. That would help me a lot. And those who have become members and are supporting this channel monthly, I really appreciate it. And you deserve all the perks that you were given and a whole lot more. So thank you for watching. People love process. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.